Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. As we get ready to hear from your scripture, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would give us the ability to understand what your word is saying to us. I pray, God, that you would make your presence known and that you would bless us. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Again, thank you for joining us. Outlines can be found at MyGraceAndTruth.com and click on the Sermons tab. The title of today's message is Grace Greater Than All My Sin. Grace Greater Than All My Sin. There's a hymn by Julia H. Johnston, and it's named Grace Greater Than Our Sin. And it has that line in it. It says, Grace, Grace, God's Grace, Grace that is greater than all our sin. And that's where the title of today's message comes from. And this is a very important truth to remember. And there's a passage of scripture that speaks to this in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is talking about sin and how sin started and the grace of God. And we read in verses 20 and 21, the Apostle Paul writes, The law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Verse 21. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so today we're going to unpack that a little bit and realize and see how grace is truly greater than all our sin. The first thing that I want you to notice from these scriptures is that the law increases sin. The law actually increases sin. In Romans 5 verse 20, we read the law came in so that the transgression or the sin would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more or where sin increased, grace increased even more. Now he says something similar in Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, beginning at verse 10, this is New Living Translation now. He says, I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. But how can that be, he says? Did the law which is good cause my death? Of course not. Sin, this force, this entity, sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death so we can see how terrible sin really is it uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes and so the law increases sin and this may seem weird because it would seem that law would diminish sin or lessen sin but the fact is, we are too broken, too, as Paul would say, enslaved by sin. Too much under sin's power for the law to do that. And so the law actually increases sin. And the law actually, another part of scripture tells us, shows us our sins. It shows us that we are sinful and that we need Christ. The second thing that I want you to see today is that where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Where sin 
abounds, where sin increases, where sin happens more and more, or, or basically increases, grace abounds even more, or increases even more. Now, before we get into this, I want to give a side note of Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. He says, if sin increases and grace increases even more, should we continue in sin? The Apostle Paul says, may it never be, or of course not. How can we continue in what we've died to? So in Christ, we die to sin. And so we're not saying that people should continue in sin or throw themselves into sin, but we're explaining the power of God's grace. So please understand that. So where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. The word increase there in that scripture is the word in Greek, pleonazo, pleonazo. And it means to superabound, to superabound. So we can understand that, okay, that seems like a lot. That's a lot. But look what happens here for grace. The word abound for abound all the more or increase even more is the Greek word hyper perisio. Hyper perisio. And it means to abound beyond measure. Beyond measure, to abound exceedingly. And so for we can understand that one thing for sin, it may be a lot. But for grace, there's even more. There's even more beyond measure. And I like to use two illustrations to really help us grasp the fact that grace is greater than sin. The first one is, is if you think about athletics. Athletics. In high school, for a person to be named All-State, that means that they're really good. They're pretty good. But in the, in professional ranks, um, people who are really good, athletes who are really good, are in the Hall of Fame. They're in the Hall of Fame. And so sin would be like an all-state high school athlete. And grace would be like a professional Hall of Famer in their prime. It's no comparison. If we put the two competing to, against each other, there's no comparison. The grace abounds beyond measure also you can think of a lake versus an ocean a lake versus an ocean a lake yeah it has a lot of water there's 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 a lot there it's a it's super abounds with water but an ocean an ocean abounds with water beyond measure and so that's the way we want to understand grace wherever there's sin there may be uh, sin may increase, but grace abounds even more beyond measure. Thirdly, I want us to understand that grace is always greater than sin. Grace is always greater than sin. Again, we're not encouraging sin, but we're ex expounding upon grace. Grace is always greater than sin. If a person sins and misses the mark, they can always come to God. They can always come to God. Scripture tells us that God will not reject a contrite or a broken heart. That's from Psalm 51, verse 17. God will not reject a contrite and broken heart. So we can come to him. We can come to him. And this is very important. It's important that we don't dwell on sin, but that we dwell on grace. We don't dwell on sin. We don't magnify sin in our, in our thoughts, but we magnify God and his grace. We dwell on grace. There's a short period of time where, of course, you confess your sin. You may mourn because of sin a little bit. But after that time, you dwell on grace. I think about David. He sinned with Shab uh, Bathsheba, and, the, and he, there was a period of mourning there. And, of course, he lost his son. His son became sick, and he fasted and everything. But after that period is over, he dressed himself, bathed himself, and went on with life. And God gave him son, his son, king, that would be the future king, Solomon. Okay? So don't dwell on sin. Dwell on grace. Next thing I want you to see 
or to understand is that allow the power of grace to work in your heart. We have to allow the power of grace to work in our heart. Proverbs 4.23 tells us, keep your heart with all diligence, or keep his watch over it, guard it. For out of it, the heart, spring the issues of life, or come the issues of life. And so we have to allow this grace to work in our hearts. And as that happens, we'll find that sin occurs less and less in our life. And righteousness occurs more and more. The word for grace here is the word caris. And it means goodwill and loving kindness or favor. But it's also speaking of, of the merciful unearned kindness by which God, and here it is, exerting his holy influence upon souls. He exerts a holy influence upon souls, and we have to allow that in our hearts. God exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, keeps them, strengthens them, and increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affection, and kindles them to exercise the Christian virtues. So this is grace working in someone's heart. And it begins to become an outpour, an outliving of righteousness because of the work of God and the work of grace in a person's heart. Again, just as sin is kind of like a force that uses something that's good for its own evil purposes, grace is a force that allowed to work in someone's life will bring about righteousness. And this is through Christ, through faith in Christ, that grace enters in. Lastly, this leads into our last point here. We receive God's grace by faith. Receive God's grace by faith. Ephesians 2.8 tells us, For by grace, by grace you have been saved through faith. It's by grace through faith. Not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. And again, it's received by faith. Colossians 1.23, the Apostle Paul is encouraging the church to stand firm in their faith. He says in verse 23, but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. At times people hear the word of God and they're so encouraged because they know through faith their sins are forgiven. But then time passes and that assurance can, can lessen, can weaken a little. But Paul says, don't drift away from the assurance you received. When you heard the good news, I would say it this way, continue to magnify grace, to continue to dwell upon great grace that you may be assured of your position before God as righteous, as clean and as saved through Christ Jesus. So receive grace by God's faith. God's grace abounds to us. It, it's God gives it to us beyond measure. And we can trust that his grace is greater than our sins. And we can come to him through Christ and receive his abundant grace. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ. and We thank you for grace. We put our faith in Christ right now to take away our sins and to bring about the grace of God in our lives and in our hearts. I pray that the power of your grace would transform the hearts of those who are listening. And God, that they would experience the goodness and the joy of the grace of God. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.